Oh my God, I'm so confused. <laughs> I, are you still doing cola too? Or oh, the home? I'm confused about, I'm confused about uh, Zoom. <laughs> How to, I couldn't even unmute myself. <laughs> just like, are you, you, you are you up, like the desktop? Yeah, I feel, I mean, it's just like unfamiliarity. I open up like the meeting and I instantly have three windows to deal with. I have like the meeting window and I have my personal window and then I have the group gallery window. Um, so I got like three screens, uh, you know, three, three different windows on two different screens. Um, it's like, God, it's gotta, there's gotta be an easier, I've heard Zoom is, is like the least awesome uh, video chat tool that there is, but they somehow were the first mover. And I think sometimes if you're the first people to do it, people just stick with it because they're too lazy to switch. Yep. Oh, they 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 deserve it. I mean, they did uh, build out quickly and um, have a pretty good reputation. But good lord, it seems to be like a hard tool sometimes to to, to mess with. They're, they're all. I, I use Teams at work, and it's it's just as funky. It's got its weird things that it does but like right now i've got like literally three screens to to manage three different like application windows to manage just in order to carry on a, a, a halfway cogent conversation <laughs> i'm using their um ipad app so it's a bit easier because you only <laughs> an ipad can only have one screen so you just <laughs> That's, you know, I try to do too much sometimes on my Mac. Um, I have, you know, th hundreds, literally hundreds of, of uh, Google Chrome windows <clears throat> and um, various other things. So I should just get a little more focused. Um, oh, well, <laughs> I said that 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, so... I'm becoming less confused, I guess, with the, the the graph stuff, just because I work so slowly and deliberately that I don't let myself um, stay confused long, but at the expense of progress. I'll, I know that's that's true. So my takeaway is homework four. I jumped right to the end, right to the probably the easiest ones. No theory, just kind of like, hey, implement these things that they actually implemented in in the collabs later, but in a slightly different form. Uh, so I'm trying to take the lessons I learned in collab two and apply them to homework four, uh, four dot two specifically. You uh, mean two dot four? Uh, maybe. Yeah, you know, home. My bad. Homework. Homework two. Homework two. Question four, section four dot two. Yes, my bad. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, because it I it's a, it's a number four going to be quite no, difficult. No. Uh, yeah. We haven't gotten that far yet. It looks like it's exactly like it's. I think this was the homework that they did before they did collab two more recently. Um, it has many of the same things about the training and uh, the little, you know, even the little code snippets they have look very similar. So. I'm gonna kind of make myself go through that and try to implement that because I really never did on collab two. I had to use, you know, the guys thing. And so um, that's kind of what's gonna take my energy. And I'm only devoting about two or three hours a week. So I'm kind of right in the middle of, of that. So, so homework two you did offline, that's the one that's in a bundle, right? It's that's not the stuff that you shared in the collab. That's right. It, but it's it, in the bundle actually. It has Python, like that apparently they were doing it not in collab, but just on a local Python. Yeah. Uh, so they have models.py, which actually has exactly the models that were in the collab too. Not exactly, but very similar. The class yeah. files are all there. So I'm going to like 
make myself, and I've, I've already, I'm right in the middle of it, I'm making myself kind of construct my own collab piece by piece modeled on collab two using the data that's in those uh, bundles, those PY files. Right. Um, I just have to get a personal confidence with being able to, you know, load load the, the torch modules, you know, um, uh, reading in the data set from the from those uh, Python geometric data set. You know, I just want to kind of get get used to that, get good at it, and then when it says how many how many nodes, oh, okay, I know how to do that. Well, there isn't a num nodes, so I got to go look at the data set and figure out what's exposed there. You know, so I'm just trying to get a little bit of a competence with basic, um, you know, access to these more advanced constructs. Yeah, I wish it was easier to reuse code snippets in Colab. It's very, it, it's like you have to kind of cut and paste stuff yeah. each time. I guess you could have your own library and put it in. That's a, that's a path to failure. Uh, so as soon as you start to make libraries in, in any Jupyter environment, you should stop. You should stop <laughs> and just think about what it is you're doing and what tool you're using to do it. I actually do it at work for some, um, like when I'm trying to experiment a little bit and I, and I have a whole bunch of little functions like that, I'll yeah. go ahead and make a, a Python. You can do it. There's a, there's a, a library you can use, a module you can use to read in um, uh, data, uh, you know, modules that are in the a directory across from you or below you. But once you go above or try to do anything in the environment, everything gets hard in your right. Yeah, I found um, like forcing classes to reload after you modify the class in like a different location and stuff. I think there's kind of like, what are they, magic scripts or whatever that you can use with Jupyter to force it to reload code, but yes. it's, it's always that's where I'm, That's where I have to ask myself, am I, am I doing it the right way here? Have yeah. I reached the limit of kind of what Jupyter was all about? Yeah, but it is nice to be able to just share a link to something to discuss it for these kind of live mm -hmm. uh, discussion sessions. But it does sound like there's a lot of overlap between the, the different homeworks. So I think kind of like um, if like at work, I find that if there is something that I need to reuse across like more than one notebook, I would put it in a function because otherwise it's just a nightmare trying to make sure that I've um, like, like I haven't like made a stupid mistake somewhere and I also find that like if it's something complicated that needs debugging then nothing really beats like a proper your pie file in an IDE really um, so kind of I think in those cases it, it does make sense just to keep things off Jupyter because at the end of the day like the, I think the strength of Jupyter is still like is specialization tools and also kind of like for quick things, but for something that is a bit more involved, it's just not the best. Right. So you, you do use, you use PyCharm generally and just go ahead and use it like a standard, um, you know, Python project. Yeah, so it's, well, it's, uh, it's, as I say, it's a mix. So there'll be, usually there's quite exploratory stuff, which does, um, I know present better in a notebook, but kind of for, um, like for example, there the project I'm working on the moon. There's like um, like a simulation calculation that does involve and is not very. Um, I mean, it took me a while to get it to right. work correctly because it's kind of like implementing like a mathematical function from a paper, and there's no nice like python library that actually does it for um like a data frame of data it's just like that there are a few implementations but it's just for individual people which is going to take for from a data set so um like for that it's just there's no way i'm going to do it in jupyter even if uh like some of the result even if like most of the results are presented in jupyter because like debugging in jupyter is just a nightmare Oh, oh, okay, I got it. When you actually have to go in there and, and debug, uh, you know, loops and things like that, you're right. It, it's, oh, it's, I do sometimes, I've, I've used PDB in Jupyter 
And it's just, it, the UI just gets really crazy. Um, okay, I, yeah, I got it. That's a, that's a good, good observation. Um, yeah, I don't do that much heavy duty, real heavy duty. I do a little bit of experimentation where I, I have to work through, like, how am I gonna approach this? And I'll go ahead and bring it into a, you know, Jupiter and it allows me to kind of iterate very quickly and um, see things very quickly. But that's about as far as I go. I don't, I don't go into. <clears throat> this is probably about as complicated as stuff as I've, I've done in uh, Python generally. But uh, yeah, okay. Well, um, I'm not sure if we should spend time on some more theoretical stuff. Probably, I think we have a. We we spent a lot of time on some good solid. You know, rubber hits the road, um, things with the, the GCNs and all that. I don't know if anybody had any, because I haven't read, I haven't really spent any time getting ahead in any of the lectures. So I may have to back off a little bit. <clears throat> and let somebody else kind of talk through some things. If, if you know, we should try to stay, I'm sure the, the material is getting way beyond what we were doing three or four weeks ago. Yeah, I actually went with the lectures and not the code. So, you know, next week I will, I'm thinking of putting in you know, time on the code. So I thought I'll do Colab 3, but then I had something else in another, um, you know, mm -hmm. um, meetup. So I had to present, so I had to prepare. Um, so, you know, so next week I'm thinking of doing collab three and homework two. I think. No? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just I was telling I I've kind of dipped my toe into homework two, but I went right to the end to the easy stuff. I didn't I didn't I just don't have any skills in the theoretical, and I have the the need and desire to get the competence in just yeah. the, the use of of the techniques that we kind of learned already. Exactly. Yeah. Reinforced, but um, and not at all in collab three. So, um, but did you say you did watch, you did um, go ahead and watch the lectures? Yes, I, I went to 13 and 14, I think, yeah. That's... Okay, you're, you're light years ahead of me. Uh, well, 13 was almost all uh, Lewin, uh, community detection, and I think there was, oh, big clam. So um, I don't know if uh, folks know this, there is a repository for network X compatible, um, uh, community detection libraries. Hang on, let me see huh. if I can find it. Community detection. So the idea is generally just using any methods that we can, that we've learned about to detect specific quote communities within a large graph. Yes, there's a whole bunch of them. So let, me, let me bring this up here. Static. So this is like Network X as like a plugin architecture or something. It's an additional um, library, I think it's called cdlib. So okay. I'm just pasting it in the chat here. So there is like, they have static community discovery of which Luvain is one and dynamic community, I think with BigClam is another. BigClam has overlapping clusters it allows. So let me see. I'm gonna stick no, the um, Slack chat for posterity. Yeah, yeah. good job. Yeah, the static has either like crisp communities, that's what they're calling it, and overlapping communities. Uh, both are static community discovery uh, methods, but it has a whole bunch of dynamic community discovery as well. So community means like sub subgraphs, basically? Like Bas basically, oh. yes. Okay. One or more nodes. And yes. is it specifically node oriented? Um, yes. Well, I mean, you would try to find uh, clusters of nodes in graphs, uh, therefore node oriented, but uh, you would also want to find strongly connected or connected you know, nodes, which is sure. goes into the edge thing. So, yeah. Right, right, of course. I mean, all the features that go along with those nodes go with it, but generally yes, of course. Yeah. the node represents the, the entity of a community. Yes. That, okay. But, but uh, unlike, uh, so uh, since you brought up features, node features, right? Uh, I don't think any of these um, um, community um, algorithms, uh, they look at the node features themselves. They actually look at the edges only, I think. Uh, okay. Okay. That makes sense, I think. 
Um, if it's purely graph, then you might just want to deal with edge information because there are other, other techniques if all you were considering was, was node features, right? Yes. Okay, that's good. That's, Have you, what, you could combine the two. Of it's, course, yeah, yeah. That's, you know, that's the point of graph neural networks, right? So edges and the node features. Well, that's very good. That might be something now. Is that, that's actually just got, uh, discussed, you said in chapter 14? Um, 13, uh, lecture 13. He covers Louvain and uh, Big Clam. So I had already seen Louvain uh, in the network docs, so I wasn't that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, he, he covers how it works, mm -hmm. which is interesting, but not really, like you said, I mean, I'm not into the theory. And, you know, while the theory is interesting, that's not what I'm focusing on. Um, but previously when I was doing homework one, um, I, th there was Louvain in there, Louvain, uh, an example. So I went with the Network X uh, plugin or Network X based uh, community detection library. But then uh, when looking at Big Clan, um, I, I just looked it up on Google and I found this. Uh, I figured that, you know, maybe this is worth the look at some point. Mm -hmm. hmm, very good. Kind of jumped ahead and you didn't even necessarily even realize it. <laughs> oh. so it's in, in, in terms of like unraveling these graphs like trying to find groups and things like that do the other algorithms work just on like the adjacency matrix um so for example if you have an adjacency matrix where you have links at different kind of corners of the matrix that's that would be like a link from kind of node three to node 100 and then from node four to node 270 if you kind of re, I wonder if you resorted that adjacency matrix, I'm wondering if you could kind of like clear up the, I'm thinking of the, the, the network in visual terms, how you have like a lot of overlaps and it's very hard to kind of identify things. But when you use these algorithms like a directed graph, it kind of resolves and it, it sorts as best it can to um, effectively cluster things together. But I'm just wondering how how that is done. If it's just on a it, on like, Lubin, on Lubin, it uses the concept of modularity, which is uh, a metric that depends on you know an aggregate node uh, or aggregate edges, right? It really doesn't care if node one is connected to node hundred. It basically yep. says at node one, you know how many uh, outgoing connections are there. That sort of thing, right? Yeah. So it's more agnostic. It's basically agnostic to the you know node at the far end. I think uh, basically it says that if I cut this edge, yeah. does my modularity increase or decrease? So if I if it does increase, then I will consider moving forward. It's like a you know uh, iterative kind of thing where you cut the edge and you see okay does it improve? Then maybe it's a candidate, right? You cut another edge and then you say does it improve? You know this sort of thing. Yeah. Makes sense. I was just, I was just wondering though, like if you resort the matrix. So you're saying, it, like the the, like a two D matrix, just connecting number one to number two, seem, seems like a really simple way to to visualize what. Uh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay, I understand what you're saying now. I think. Uh, well, so yeah, there there is actually uh, it's a good point. I mean, if you resort the matrix, you should be able to see patterns, right? Uh, you know, yeah. by connection. So, right. uh, in fact, I think um, towards the middle of lecture thirteen, um, mm -hmm. he shows you a, a kind of a two D matrix, and yeah. to illustrate the difference between, you know, the, you know, something like uh, Louvain, which does not have overlapping clusters, and something like uh, Big Clam, which does. So essentially, he shows you like two squares, right? Two, mm -hmm. So you have this 2D matrix. Yeah. On the top left, you have a dark square of nodes or, you know, basically adjacencies, right? Yeah. And on the bottom uh, right, you have another um, box, yeah. right? Exactly. And yeah, they're kind of disjoint at this point with Louvain. Um, what, you know, by when Louvain does the clustering, it creates these dis disjoint boxes. Whereas with Big Clam, it actually uh, creates boxes which overlap with each other. So yeah, I, I think you you know on a good uh, yeah point there. Yeah. 
But effectively, if you did move a node, if you want to resort that matrix, you'd have to do that simultaneously for everything that was also connected to that. Like, so if, if you know, X3 becomes X100 to put yes. it close to things that it links to, then everything that was linking to X3 now has to be updated to link to X100. And it's almost like, how do you resolve those dependencies? Because they they all depend on each other and they're all moving at the same right. time. It's really yeah. hard to, to resolve that in one pass, in one yeah. step, because exactly. every target is changing unless you have some kind of, I don't know, pointer in direction or something. Hmm. But when you do it as a visualization, it's you can see the graph kind of shake out as mm -hmm. it as different nodes kind of push away from each other, just using the kind of the force graph um, effect. But that's that's a real kind of physics simulation as opposed to a single pass sort of a matrix. It it it, it takes time and it it resolves over time basically. So I'm wondering. I don't know, maybe you could just move one node at a time and update everything that points to that node and then just keep sorting the, the 2D matrix until, until you've effectively flushed out things that are close to each other. Because um, the ordering in that matrix is, I guess, random when, when you load it up. But yes. if you can cluster things in that 2D space, then it, they also become easy to visualize because I, I guess when we're plotting them, you're also just looking at a 2D visual. Right. right. Hmm. Hmm. I have to look at that. So there's a 2D matrix that represents edges yeah. and it also represents other things? Well, doesn't it? I mean, an adjacency matrix, the way I understood it is just like X and Y is like node three is connected to node seven. I, I, right. I mean, when you do it as a, a whole, not a sparse matrix, like if it's a list of no, a list of edges, like an edge list is just like three, seven, five, three, four, nine. So you could basically take those as coordinates yep. in a 2D matrix right. and then it just represents one dot that actually represents an edge connecting the X coordinate and the Y right. coordinate. Um, so you end up with a whole bunch of dots but then could you somehow resort those? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. resort, move them around. I mean, their, their position in the matrix actually m means something. Yeah, it's- Yeah. It's a, I, that's an interesting concept though. Yeah, just trying to, trying to understand if it, if it would help in the visualization, I, I guess, because an edge is described as one dot in the matrix. Which implies connections to two nodes. Yeah, exactly. And when you're looking at a graph after it's plotted, it is, I mean, you're seeing nodes and edges. And, and what I was trying to figure out is like when you get, I mean, like the, the visualization that you plotted that I'm looking in Slack looks, you know, really clean and nice, but you could probably also have, that could have come out like really confusing at the beginning and Network X just kind of resolved it and, and, and laid it out in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time looking at kind of flowcharts of logic that people are doing. And when you first kind of draw it out, if you don't think about it properly, you just get like a completely confusing diagram. But then if you kind of let it shake itself out or let, let you know, your plotting tool kind of redraw the flowchart, it will find the most clean way with a minimum number of overlaps and stuff. All right, yeah. There are also policies, I think, you know, there's like force, you know, they, I don't remember the names, right. but basically they, they have different policies to push these things out to, and make it cleaner. So there's like the rendering algorithm or whatever. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm more familiar with using these with like a client side library, like D3 or something where you actually see it kind of, first of all, it's like a splat uh -huh. and then gradually the physics kind of iterates through and, and 
it kind of finds its state of greatest equilibrium, I, I guess, kind of like water finding its own level, basically. Yeah, that's right. But that's an incredibly complicated simulation. Whereas if you're just running a pass on a 2D matrix, I don't know, I don't, I'm not quite sure if that would work because if you have like a node two connected to node two, they are by definition in the same kind of quadrant of the matrix. So I guess what you want to do is you, don't, you want to have stuff that both axes, you want to have a kind of diagonal cluster. So you want to have like 77 connected to 78, but you don't want to have a thing where it's like two connected to 100. Well, 77 connected to 78 would, you know, so this is like a linearity assumption or a Markov assumption, right? So if you're saying that, uh, you know, any node can only be connected to nodes that are X away from it, right? Yeah. Uh, it's similar to what you have in NLP, where you have, say, Mark, you know, the Markov assumption, basically, right? So any word is, uh, you know, the probability of a word occurring is only um, predicated by the words that occur right below, before it, that is like micro, Markov 1, or maybe three spaces before it, the Markov 3, right? This sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, I'm not really familiar. You're talking about Markov chains or something? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, just a slight brain fart. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at like um, section or uh, lectures in 13. It's all about communities, all yes. about strong and weak ties and um, very much what we're talking about, I think. Yeah, right. that's, yeah, that's basically the big push on that uh, on 13. On 14, yeah. it's uh, basically different uh, null model graphs like uh, you know, Ardo Strainy random graph, then um, small world graph. Another one, which is he calls chronicle graph, which reminds me of fractals. But you know, both of them, all of them are like synthetic graphs, which you use to approximate reality. And, you know, it serves as a good null model, right? So when you're doing hypothesis generations, uh, this would be your eight zero, basically. Hmm. Now, are there actual exercises that get to things in in later less later collabs? Um, not sure, but the, uh, the homework one uh, has uh, one exercise. I think maybe number one, where he asks you to create uh, three different kinds of graphs. Right, one is a small world model, one is a random graph, and then he asks you to compare it with the real graph. Uh, you know the the degree distribution. So that is kind of, I think, related to lecture 14. Okay. Well, I, yeah. I don't dip into those homeworks too deeply. Uh, interesting. Let's see here. Like Colab 4. Does Colab 4 have like community detection lessons and things like that? I have no idea. I haven't seen yeah. it. I hope so. It's, it looks it looks very interesting. It always does. Looking ahead, um, yeah. I think the uh, lecturer he's like a scientist at Pinterest as well. So he's probably doing a lot of like clustering of like similarity of uh, images that people pick out. Oh yeah, I mean they're they're all over that. That's that's fascinating um, and obviously useful and valuable. Um, yeah. There is also another guy, Michael Bronstein, or well, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but he's like, he does a lot of this graph work and he's a um, scientist at Twitter. And he, uh, some of his posts are kind of really worth reading as well. Mm -hmm. Some of his. Twitter posts? Uh, no, like medium. Twitter engineering, okay. And he, he's one of, is he one of the developers on the, the, the Stanford library that they want us to use or he's um, just a co-lecture? Lecture no, he, he's at Imperial College. Okay. Nothing to do with um, Stanford. Bronstein, what's his? Uh... Yeah, I, 
I, I've pasted the link oh, if you want. Thank you. That's his blog. See how much my RSS reader can scrape off so I don't have to pay for medium. Yeah, actually, I subscribed to medium. I don't know why a long time ago, but it seems to be kind of worth it. It just seems it's I, I go back and forth. Um, yeah, I, I have mixed feelings. I mean, I think it's really good to support a site that has such great content on it, but they kind of did a bait and switch in that they motivated a whole bunch of publishers and said it was always going to be free for publishers and they run the ad support and then they flipped it to charge people so they kind of put a paywall around everybody's content after they got everyone to put their ah interesting i never thought about it yeah. how much does it uh, cost i'm curious i'm sure uh, it's like might be five a month or something something oh, okay non-trivial yeah five a month is high i think it Ten is. a year or something i would go with it Yes, you could go broke at five dollars a month. <laughs> well, no, not really. But oh, you know. um, like, well, it depends on how lazy you are about opening things in incognito, right? Yes, yes of course. <laughs> yeah. as many medium articles as you want for free in incognito. Mode. Good point. Good point. Yeah, same with downloading music or. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, you can get like a medium Chrome plugin that kind of resets the cookies every time, but feels a bit sneaky. Yeah. Anyway, um, so did, did, what else did you discover going through this um, homework? I'm actually just booting, up, booting it up now. Did you, did you create a, if, if these are just offline Python files, did you create like a um, requirements and all that kind of stuff to run it? No, I just copied and pasted them right into my collab. They're just class. They're just classes. Right. Yep. So I kind of. I mean, there isn't really any extra packages you need beyond like the standard ones and now for eggs. Needs so I think right? needs PyTorch. It does. It does. Oh yeah, but most of the collabs are they using PyTorch. So right now. Assuming that you have Python, right. they're, they're just Python files. So I was wondering. So you just paste those Python files into a collab, as opposed to like trying to run it locally as a. Right. As a, right. Um, I'm trying to use. I'm trying to use collab. Yeah. More to get comfortable with that as well. Um, right. So I just copy them into a little section and trying to learn how to use the outline function. Just you know, trying to combine a lot of. A lot of skills to do yeah. these better. Right. But you do have to load the same way that we had to kind of install um, the torch business because all those things are used to even read in the data sets. Mm -hmm. Right. I think mm -hmm. it, it, it was not working until I loaded in. Torch sparse, torch scatter, all that, just like yeah. I had done before. Torch geometric. So HW2 is not the same as Colab2, obviously, I guess. Yeah, they're different. No. They're yeah. different. No, it's actually, though, Q4 is a lot like Colab2 so far, at least in the general structure of a GC. I think, um, in some ways, it's actually closer to Colab 3 because uh -huh. it's a, there's like a graph stage and a graph attention. Oh, you're right. You're right. implementation, which is more or less exactly the same as Colab 3. Okay. The first question, um, both of you. There's a there's kind of minor differences in how this there are like structured implementations. So I'm still not completely um sure. Um yeah, but mm -hmm. I think question four and one are easier and then two and three because it's a bit more theoretical. I haven't quite managed to get get my head around them yet. Right. I do like 
seeing different implementations, even just slight differences in like a forward function and trying to reconcile each one makes me, you really do start to understand what's really going on. Um, like I think in your implementation versus the implementation that we used, um, that, that one guy that we were using, the, just how they approached detecting the first, the, you know, the last layer um, you know, in the forward function. I thought that was kind of interesting. Just, I mean, it, it all matters. It, at the end of the day, every line of code has to work. Yep. Yeah, I may dip into Colab 3 now that you mention it, because I'm just starting to mess with the, the, the graphs age and GAT part of homework 2. Oh, cool. OK. So OK, that, that's a good takeaway. And just looking at the slides makes me want to watch the lectures, because those are so pretty inspiring um, and direct and logical, but the, but the content is just so out there. Yeah, it would be nice if somebody made notes, you know, like I didn't see good notes being made, right? Like uh, which covers the video with the salient points highlighted. That way you can go through it faster, you know. Um, Interesting. So as if there was some transcript, um, which there is obviously, because it's, it's, it's automatically being generated. Right. But this is like a human transcriber who basically abstracts out the important parts for you. <laughs> Interesting. That, does that exist? Like, did, literally, does the transcript exist? It obviously does because it's being presented as text words. Um, usually, uh, so in the other, uh, the DL PyTorch thing that I'm uh, also doing, uh, they have uh, students from NYU who basically collaborate to write up um, you no. know, yeah. uh, notes and they are kind of shared. So, uh, you know, the notes are aggregated and then shared on the net again, you know, internet. Right. Huh. Well, I'm not sure Stanford has too much of an incentive to do much more than what they're doing. Probably, um, yeah. yeah. At the expense of, of, of uh, tuition, <laughs> you know, um, the more they make available that competes with their own tuition, you know, that, yeah, exactly. That's yeah. kind of yeah. a perverse incentive. Um, Although I suppose, like, at the end of the day, like, even if they release everything online, you still don't get access to, like, TAs and stuff, right? If you get stuck. Right. Oh, right. yeah. And it only it only bolsters the um, um, reputation of their of their um, staff. Mm -hmm. So they, I'm sure they have an incentive for wide use. Uh, yeah, that's that's one thing that occurred to me. Like you know, uh, currently at least in these top schools, um, students are you know they have to go through a lot. I mean. Uh, I, I think back to my time at college and, you know, I did have this kind of homework, not at this volume, oh. right? But, yeah. So oh. when you, um, sorry, just to go on a tangent slightly. So when you um, brought these uh, homework Python files into a, a Colab notebook, I no noticed it's using like import models, uh, assuming that there would be a separate file called models. So did you kind of refactor the code so that each of the individual files become basically functions and then use those as kind of like namespace wrappers to, to get around stuff? Well, the mo models file is in, the, it's also in the, in the bundle. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. But when you just paste it in as a, yep. Um, yep. into the Python file, then you can't import it, but it within, so models would have been a module with the functions inside it. And so I'm just wondering when you were bringing it in, did you, well, actually, maybe I just don't need to actually. Uh, you just, you just, drop you, just don't, you just don't include the import things, right? Yeah, so just, drop it, the code, just drop the code right into your, into your you know, you got to go cell by cell kind of. Yeah, yeah. 
and once it's there, it's of course going to be, it's going to run. And yeah, so previously it was namespacing like models.classname, so you just take out that namespacing, right? Uh, sure. Right, right. I mean, Got it. I guess you could. Yeah, just wondering if there was a, if there was a neater way when you'd, um, when you'd run through it. I mean, I can, I can show you briefly. Uh, is this the right one? Yeah. So previously there was, you know, there's a file called models in the homework, in the bundle. And then later on in the next code, it had, it was importing that as a file and then referring down to like models.gnn stack, which is that class that's defined in the top of uh, what was models. So I'm just wondering if there's like, I can't remember if you can do this with Python, like module models or something like that to kind of. That's yeah, and just, just remove models dot in the yeah. uh, next just few things, yeah. Bit nasty, losing all that nice namespacing, but I guess it's, it's that's the easiest way to do it, yeah. Cool, all right. So I mean, like, if you, if, you, uh, if you put everything into the same file, there, the namespacing doesn't make any sense anyway. Right. Sure. And then you want to take out all the arc parts. So. Yeah, it's just a little bit. Everything now has like global namespace, which seems a little bit like asking for trouble, but I guess it's not that much code, so it should be all right. That's the way I'm looking at it. It's, ju it's just an exercise. It's just a homework. Um, right. Also, to... um, I think of Jupyter Notebooks as prototyping, um, a prototyping tool. Yeah. So you would, you know, once you get everything running, you basically move it into its right namespace and you know factor it out into different files and whatnot. Yeah. Right? And well, two two approaches. One is prototyping, and another is for you know showing your um, prototype, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Right. You know, showing your customers so you can see you know what it can produce and so forth. So yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The Google Docs of coding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, very nice. Yeah, that's a good analogy I'll use later. Yeah, or um. I don't know. I guess it's better than like, I don't know. Has anyone actually tried out the, I mean, VS Code has a fantastic plugin for doing um, shared uh, shared development now. It might be interesting to try that for a different session, but you just kind of install it and then you share whatever code you're working on and everyone can see your, not only the editing that you're doing, but also you can have shared, shared shells. Um, but obviously the, 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 Terminal inside VS Code. It's a it's a pretty um pretty well done um kind of pair programming environment. It's a lot less hassle than setting up like you know Tmux and all those kind of things. Anyway, no, I've never used it. I've heard about it. I've seen it. I will clean this up and share it. It's done. Sounds good. Yeah, that's kind of what we're working through. Those that exact exercise. That's what I'm going to just try to do to feel comfortable in doing those, just those, the GCN stuff that we did originally. Yeah. And yeah. yeah it's, 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 it, it does approach it differently. The prediction task is kind of called out. Um, so, yeah. yeah nothing. Then like in Collapse, they also um, introduced like a slightly different package called DeepSnap, which um, they kind of, uh, kind of apparently it does, it sort of help you handle some of the splits and stuff that they're discussing in the lecture. Um, kind of around like, you know how, I think a few lectures back to discussing how to implement the various of uh, splitting strategies for train tests and for um, train validation tests. And I think the right. um, so basically introduces like some of that. Um, cool. And I was also watching a bit of lecture 15 last night and they're kind of getting into graph RNNs, which is Quite interesting because it's like taking some of their concepts from lecture 14. So in lecture 14, they are discussing 
um, the different random graphs generators and how, uh, like what the limitations are around, um, like imitating real world graphs. And you can actually do a much better job using RNNs, which um, you, uh, as applied to a graph. So you, you can use the RNNs to generate a node. And then after that, you generate um, on the new graph, you generate the edges. And then another step is to generate one more node and then more edges. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and apparently That's um, really cool. it kind of imitates the real world a lot better yeah. than like the other ones. Like generative networks? Like recurrent networks to generate graphs. So if you need to, like for example, if you want to generate molecule candidates that imitate like real molecules, you can use the graph finance to um, basically spit out the relevant nodes and links kind of one step at a time, like uh, similar to what you would do for text in finance with a few extra tricks. I've not, I haven't done a lot of text things like that, but I guess it makes sense that you could probabilistically uh, create stuff, right? Create based on the, the whole the whole background. So you could do the same for, for graphs, um, which would be a candidate molecule. And then you could what pass the candidate through some other criteria to make it worthy of more investigation in, in the physical world or not. Um, that's the stuff that's really going to, I think, be beneficial to, uh, to hum you know, humanity over maybe communities of pictures and Pinterest. <clears throat> Would you Pro probably useful for some for some things, of course, but you know. yeah, I mean they're all applications, right? I mean. So Pinterest improves humanity in different ways, I guess. Yeah. Yep, that's yeah. true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. It's also, I guess, always important to think about the, what are the kind of real life examples of, of things that we're talking about. Um, if, whenever I listen to a Twimmel talk and I hear a guy from from Twitter or something talking about their worlds, it's or uh, LinkedIn in, in particular, it's just always so clear how yeah. beneficial these communities can be for various reasons, hiring or um, just interest groups, things like that. Right, yeah. And of yeah, course- also, No, sorry, go ahead. I'll just say, well, of course, we're predicting um, conversions for e-commerce and things like that. It makes sense from a business perspective. Right. Yeah, I think it's also the cost of, you know, what happens when you make a mistake, right? So if it's in banking, somebody loses money. Right. If it's with medicine, somebody dies. If it's with e-commerce, you know, somebody gets upset. Right. So. Yeah. Good point. Every every one of those is legitimate in its own yeah, right. space. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, the whole thing with medicine, in particular, is is why the trial system is like it is. Is that the the cost of mistakes is very high. Right. Yeah. So making those mistakes. Um, you know, vir virtually in a sense, is probably makes a lot of you know good reason to to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is very cool. Yeah. Well, now, so there's also examples of people using graph neural nets for like city planning and stuff. Well, not exactly city planning, but I was reading a paper mm. a few weeks back where they're using testing it to use it to like control traffic lights in a simulation sort mm -hmm. of scenario. And kind of they say basically we can't do this for a smart city and it will make the traffic great. <laughs> so I think Right, that's interesting because you have to model the problem in you know in such a unique way. Classic methods probably have all sorts of queuing and things like that, but uh, using these more advanced techniques allows you to have considerations for features that you never would have thought of before. Um, which is kind of like the combination of both classical techniques that might be able to model 
the wait times of a particular roadway and use that as just a feature um, in a bigger network of considerations. That's uh, no end in the amount of things, I guess. Yeah, urban planning, that sounds really important for the ongoing um, just, you know, happiness generally of people. It seems like we're, well, actually the COVID thing kind of upset that tendency to gather in cities more and more. We tend to now yeah. kind of. Yeah, I had a colleague in Brooklyn, he was, and his dad lived upstate and it was like all he could do to get the hell out of there. Yep. Yeah, sure. yeah. My, uh, my, son, my son lived in Brooklyn until uh, last March. Hmm. They had a baby in Brooklyn and went upstate to stay with their in-laws, the other set of grandparents. Hmm. Okay. And, yeah. uh, now they live in Denver. So that's an exact example of the, the, the yeah. tendency to not congregate in cities uh, is real. Yeah, but, we, we have the option. Many countries don't, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have okay. these wide open spaces. Okay. We still have the need for for, for factories and, and things where the, mm -hmm. the congregation is just necessary. So given the fact that there's going to be more people than there are, you know, or the roadways, there's only so much you can do with a roadway. Designing the control systems around those seems really important, exactly. especially as you might introduce automated vehicles uh -huh. to the equation. Yes. Yeah. Are any of you software architects, by the way? No, I'm a monitoring engineer. Okay, okay. Yeah, I found something cool, but off topic, but mainly for software architects, since we are talking about maps. What's and, that? Yeah. What did, what did you find? I mean, I, I'm kind of half doing software architecture. Okay, okay. So this is a, you know, an approach called C4 to draw diagrams that define an architecture, right? It's oh. a very structured way. So it goes from, you know, like the whole system and then it says, uh, here is the, what's that called next? I think the component and then the class. I can, I can send you this if you want. So it's like a event flow diagram. Um, it, it's, I'm not an architect, but so, yeah. uh, you know, so let me, let me send it to you, you know, if you like, yeah. Yeah. and there is a nice video. Um, See that in the chat. C4, yes. got, C4 got thrown around, got talked around in my company maybe six months ago as a legitimate necessity for some architectures. And the monitoring aspect was that there's aspects of somewhere in the, in the diagrams we can identify things that you'd want to monitor. Right, yeah. Yeah, that, but, but very, uh... yeah and he has uh, another tool uh, called Structurizer, which actually I thought was very cool, where you write JSON, right, to define your model and it creates graph um, pictures, uh, diagrams for you. Oh, yeah. so, so now you can actually, you know, put your diagrams in GitHub because you can put the JSON, right? Yeah, well, I mean, there's some, um, what's it called? There's dot, like dot, dot, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and plant yeah. L and lots of different um, kind of mini syntaxes for drawing graphs and, and common libraries to actually render those uh, diagrams. Um, and you can even get that. There's a nice plugin for VS Code. So, like, while you're writing, you can have another panel that's rendering every time you kind of edit the file. Um, oh, okay. Oh. So, yeah, I mean, that is definitely, I mean, I, I work with a lot of um, people more on, I mean, we're doing chatbots and stuff. So we have more like flow diagrams for how the conversation. I, I see, okay. Uh, the event. The just doing these lucid charts and then someone wants to add something and it just takes so much time. It's like, messing around making the diagram kind of trying to organize the diagram because when you add a link from one thing to a link on a, another location suddenly your diagram gets all messy and 
using Lucidchart or those kind of, you know, like Visio or whatever, you have to manually refactor the whole chart to make sense. Um, but trying to get less tech, more kind of business people to use these text-based ways of defining their conversations is a bit of a uphill battle, to be honest. It is, it is. I like some of the advances just in, in Kubernetes, you know, to basically put code around your, your, your entire implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, I think, is a level above that, but going up into the application. Right. Yeah. yeah. But that's, I think this is all very useful abstractions. Well, I mean, these kind of things have been around for like code generation. I mean, mainly for databases and stuff. But then I think for huge kind of enterprise-y type apps, I think people write these abstractions and it generates all your class kind of files and everything. But they're kind of one way. Like once you start adding code to the class file, you can't go back and modify the the system diagram. Right, right. Yes. But, well, yeah. this, is, this, this is interesting though, that it reveals um, a graph orientation to something mm -hmm. that we all right. are, are yeah. familiar with. Huh. Yeah, I mean, that's very specific kind of syntax to those diagrams like, um, uh, when you're using composition versus inheritance or when you have like a factory uh, that's creating new instances of objects, I think you use different visual um, visual symbols to to give a hint to the <laughs> diagram that you're actually doing. Context containers, components, and code. Yeah, yeah I'm just looking at those myself. I'm just looking through the, the structurizer. Right. I, I think any any discipline in, in thinking, struck, uh, you know, um, in this way, just, yeah, it helps make your work. Yeah, but this seems extremely high level. It's like application database, like right. you know, within a database, there's all kinds of different ways of, of or within an, an application, there's all kinds of different ways of, whether, of how you'd actually structure your yep. code. Um, it's well, not all yeah. components. It's almost yeah. like microservices and services begin to yeah. creep in here pretty quickly, which is good. It's nothing wrong with that. I, I build little implementations of services, APIs all the time. Right. For general reuse. And it makes you think, it makes you think a certain way of, of being very explicit in your parameters. Yeah. But like, for example, if you're writing in an adapter pattern that has to take inputs or you have like a message bus that's kind of distributing events like how do you model that kind of stuff in in yeah. this it only seems to have like containers and components it doesn't right. really... it doesn't go that next level where the actual you know yeah i i watched the video he did mention for functional type and i'm not sure if this actually um, um you know fits in he says uh, Convert your components and your so your classes. He said, "I think that would be code. Uh, the components into uh, modules and your code or classes into functions. So that could be, you know, one way to look at it. So, yeah. yeah, that's the, the mapping of those into the into this construct. Right in the functional uh, model, right? Yeah. Right. So let's say you're doing an app that uses message passing to send back and forth kind of a sequence of events right, right, and you're trying yeah. to model that kind of and you have like three layers so you've got like an external service an internal service a, a back end and mm. different events going back and forth like over a timeline view i don't know quite how you'd model yeah. that out in this right yeah yeah in this Good format point. yeah but uh but yeah so it's it's better than doing this stuff in Visio or something. Anything else, yes. Yeah. I guess UML is the thing that people have been using for that kind of stuff for a long time. I guess. I guess. Yes. More or less, off and on. Right. Nothing ever really got standardized in any company I've ever worked for. It's all right. Yeah. I don't know. I've been mostly in startups. UML has always had this kind of image of 
huge corporations generating like a hundred thousand class files for something. Right. And they, they might do it and then it gets archived because right. it was on somebody's annual OKR and then right. it never, never gets used. Yeah. And I mean, all that when you're doing like machine generated code, I, where I work, there's a lot of these things called protobufs, which is basically a way of communicating between C++ system and a Python system or, or whatever. And, and all of the stuff is serialized using um, these protobufs. But then a lot of the generated code on both sides is just like really, really nasty to work with compared to someone who's like crafted a nice API, basically. It's kind of like the new soap in a way. Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. I've used protobufs a few times and they're, I just like, very carefully implemented exactly what it said to do and it worked and I didn't even care what was right. going on under the covers. Yeah. Well, it's very high, highly performant, but it's not that pleasant to work with. Yeah, I think it was an early foray I took into machine learning, maybe in 2012 or 13 or something. Mm -hmm. And it was probably Google. I was probably doing some Google. They have like a prediction. Right service or something and it, i think it was using protobufs for that yeah oh man i think some of like if you use tensor for like a lot of the models and stuff are still safe as protobufs yeah i mean but it's, yeah, it's like uh, most of the complexity is hidden from you because I see. you just treat it like any other safe file it's packaged up nicely and yeah and my company like actually uses a lot of protobufs um, in like their microservices, but luckily I never really have to mm. touch any of that um, because it's all like the backend guys who are doing it. Yeah, well, it's perfect for that kind of low level microservices where you just want to send like binary data over the wire or something. Yeah, that's, I remember, I recall now, I was, I think my, my predictions were very simple. I had like 1K of data and I had to put it into this thing that could handle like up, up to 500 megs or some crazy thing. I'm like, do I really have to do this? They, yep, you just do. Right. That was, that's good. Anyway, well, good, good discussion on, on something. So um, did, did you get through converting the um, that homework one in the end. I'm just wondering. I need. To... Oh, I'm right in the middle of it. I'm actually just like literally. Um, just I just pasted in or like earlier earlier today. I'm just now working on the uh, the forward function of the GNN stack. Okay. And that's that's as far as I've gotten. <laughs> <laughs> And it's just like the collab that says your code goes here. And so. Right. I got to think through now exactly how we implemented our forward function before and start thinking about what is the difference between an adjacency matrix and an edge index, because I have to know how to do it right here, um, which is the whole reason I took, took this took this on was to know exactly what to do in code like this. Yeah, yeah try, try printing it out. Maybe that'll help. Or doing a dot size in it to figure out what the size is. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Kind of like all oh, the data that comes in just to understand what it is I'm dealing with. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I tend to, my first, I'll do that sometimes or I'll go look at another example, but then that implementation might have slightly different conditions. So you end up going back to teasing apart the thing you have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, very classic kind of troubleshooting approaches. But yeah, well, that's, that's kind of what I gotta do. But at this point I have to try to get to a tennis but it's possibly raining. Uh, so I may, may or may not be able to do that. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going hit to the, hit the road here. All right. 
nice talk today. Yeah. Yeah. As yeah. always. As always. Okay. More code progress this week. Yep, yep. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Take care, everyone. All right, you too. Thanks. Bye. Bye.